as you walk down the halls of the SCP Foundation Site-19. Peeking in the various windows at the anomalies contained there, you might catch a glimpse of a dark figure bent over a table, tinkering away like an artisan in his workshop. A vintage black apothecary bag sits next to him, open, and if you stop and watch for a while, you'll see him pull all manner of tools out of it, impossibly large tools, things that shouldn't fit in such a small bag, a bone saw, an IV stand, jars of fluorescent liquids, and needles the length of your forearm. You shouldn't be surprised. This is a place for impossible things, after all. Still, it's a curious sight, the shadowy man working so diligently, so quietly, focused singularly on his craft, whatever that might be. Only one thing could distract him from his efforts, you. He feels your gaze on him, and he looks up, dark eyes glittering from behind a beaked ceramic mask. He reminds you of an illustration you once saw in a book about the Black Death, the gear the plague doctors wore while treating patients on their deathbeds. Hello. He greets you in a friendly, heavily accented voice. His eyes crinkle beneath the mask, and if you could see his mouth, you know he'd be smiling. How are you today, dear fellow? Are you feeling quite well? He takes a step toward the window, stretching out one gloved hand, and you suddenly realize that you can't see where the mask ends and his skin begins. It's not a mask, but a part of his face. This is no ordinary man. Do you require help? I can examine you. He offers, palm pressed flat against the glass, a chill runs up your spine, and you realize that you should definitely not take him up on his offer. No matter how friendly he seems, how good his intentions may be, you wouldn't want to let the plague doctor treat you. He sat in his containment cell, fidgeting with his favorite scalpel. He dragged it over the surface of his work table, back and forth, listening to the sound it made. They had tried to confiscate his table, his tools. The guards had quickly learned that he had more of them in his bag. They tried to take away his bag from him, but, well, that didn't go over too well for anyone involved. So he was allowed to keep it, to fashion himself a makeshift laboratory in his lonely little cell. There was a time where they had given him test subjects, fresh corpses from the morgue for him to dissect and research. There was a time when the doctors here would come to speak with him, talking of cryptobiology and the pestilence he had dedicated himself to fighting. Those days were long gone. He had hidden away pieces of the corpses, tissue samples in jars of formaldehyde he could pull out when the monotony became too much. But the days of fresh materials, of enlightened discourse with other men and women of science, were over. How he missed those days. The chance to work with others as he once had. What had he done wrong? All he did was treat the sick. Sure, they didn't always understand their illness, didn't want to receive their medicine, but that wasn't a choice for the patient to make. That should have been up to the physician. Perhaps they didn't trust his expertise, didn't see how his work served the greater good. Like those who watched Jonas Salk invent the polio vaccine, or Louis Pasteur rid milk of bacteria, they were confused by the advanced scientific practices and feared that which they did not understand. He could forgive them for their ignorance. He was magnanimous that way. If only they would let him out of this infernal room, he could prove his work's worth to them. He could cure them all, begin a new era of wellness and peace worldwide. He didn't exactly sleep, but when he rested on his little cot in the corner of the room, he dreamed of that future, of a world healed by his touch. A knock at the door stirred him from his reverie. Someone, someone was at the door of his containment cell. He glanced at the little window and saw a guard there with a tray of food. He greeted the man with an enthusiastic wave. Sustenance. He didn't require the food for survival, of course, but it helped his mind work more efficiently. It reminded him of a time before these fluorescent lights and these same four walls of crusty bread with fresh butter by the banks of the Seine. A little slot opened in the door and the tray was shoved through. There was bread, just as he hoped, a small dish of butter, a pot of jam, and a cup of tea still seeming. He picked up the cup at first, taking a deep breath. Ah, an herbal blend with fresh lavender. Lovely. He couldn't see the guard through the window anymore, but he called out to him just the same. Thank you for the libations. 
He still had his manners after all, even in confinement. He wished he could have gotten a better look at the man, seen the pallor of his complexion, a tremor in his hand. He thought he had spotted sweat beating on his forehead. Could he be ill? The case required further examination to be certain. He sighed, clutching the cup of tea tighter in frustration. Why wouldn't they just let him work? Why must they scream at the sight of his efforts, flee from his instruments? It didn't seem fair. Still, the pursuit of science rarely was a glamorous one. He had learned as much over the centuries. One day, though, history would look back on him kindly. Of this, he could be certain. He was just settling in and beginning to spread butter across the admittedly stale bread when a horrible sound shook him to attention. He had heard the noise before, though he had never seen its source. It was an ear-splitting scream, a wail of pure agony, like the sound of a wounded wild animal. He had heard many, many screams during his life, from patients and those who stood in the way of his work, but until he had been brought into custody of the Foundation, he had never heard a scream quite like this one. It was pure rage, devastation, and suffering mixed together, wet with tears, and loud enough to rip through human vocal folds. Whatever was crying out, it was no mere man. More screams answered it, and these were very much human. These sounds were more familiar to him. Shrieks of pain, of fear, of desperate but futile attempts to escape. Then the meaty thud of bodies falling to the floor, of torn off limbs hitting walls and windows, a loud crash, and the sound of something large moving quite quickly through the halls. Scientific curiosity got the better of the doctor, and he found himself moving back to his little window, face pressed to the glass so hard his beak nearly cracked it. He couldn't see much of anything, just guards running down the hall, weapons drawn. He saw one of them fire, heard the gunshot ring out, but what was he firing at? Then he saw it, a pale blur darting past the door. Whatever it was, it didn't so much as flinch when the bullet ricocheted off its skin. A long, thin arm crashed against the door, knocking the doctor backwards into his work table. He steadied himself and climbed back to his feet, taking in the damage done to the door. It was crumpled in on itself, nearly ripped off the hinges, and whatever had plowed into it was already gone. From the sounds of chaos in the distance, it had disappeared around the corner, with the guards following it. He inspected the ruins of the door to his containment cell. It was useless now, hanging loose and open. Well, that was an invitation he was hardly about to decline. He grabbed his trusty bag, tossed his scalpel back inside, and set off to see what all the commotion was. It was easy enough to follow the trail of blood, stark and vivid red against the white tile floor, and the sound of gunfire, human screams, and that loud, long, painful wail he had heard before. He walked at a leisurely pace, taking his time, until the sound suddenly stopped. He rounded the corner and found a mound of bodies, guards and scientists, beaten and bloodied, almost beyond recognition. It was quiet here, save for one sound, the sound of weeping. There in the corner, huddled over with its face to the wall, was a pale, thin figure, its shoulders heaving with the force of its sobs. This poor soul was clearly in great distress. It was a peculiar sight, hairless and white, extended arms wrapped around itself as it cried. Excuse me, the doctor cried out to the pitiful creature. Are you all right? Do you need assistance? It didn't answer. It just continued to cry. Had something so despondent been responsible for this destruction? The dozens of corpses, the smashed in walls, the crumbled doors and shattered windows. It seemed impossible. Sure, it was large and looked strong, but he had never seen a monster cry before. This couldn't be a dangerous creature. Not when it was so sad. He would help it. But first, he would attend to some of these bodies. He sat his bag on the ground and pulled out several vials of liquid, a set of syringes, and a variety of other surgical tools he might need. Now after such a long hiatus, he could resume his work in a meaningful way. He couldn't be certain how long he worked reviving these poor souls and reconstructing their bodies as the pale creature wept in the corner. The sobbing faded into the background for a while, becoming a kind of white noise as he removed a liver here, placed it in a chest cavity there, poked and prodded, injected and extracted, testing out new methods alongside tried and true cures. 
One by one, the milky eyes fluttered open, rigor mortis stiff joints creaked into motion, sallow faces looking at his with the vacant gratitude he saw in so many patients over the years. He didn't need to thank him with their words. The work was its own reward. He expected more guards to arrive, to attempt to contain the situation, but none came, even as the alarm blared overhead. As for the morose creature, it didn't seem to notice his presence at all, not even when he had brought all of the intact corpses back to life. The patient shuffled around the room aimlessly, waiting for orders of some kind. The doctor tapped one on the shoulder and handed the reborn man a vial of thick black medicine. Give this to the poor fellow in the corner, please. It wasn't much, but it should calm him, provide some relief from his suffering. The corpse nodded, mouth hanging loose and open, an eyeball dangling unseen from the socket. He shuffled over to the strange creature and held out the vial to it. It turned, lifting its head, and as it locked eyes with the cured patient, something shifted in its face. Its mouth opened wide, impossibly wide, and it shrieked, that same terrible sound as before. Tears streamed from its colorless eyes, its arms shaking with unbridled rage as its jaws locked around the patient's head. Like a boa constrictor, in one fluid motion, it swallowed the revived man whole while the doctor watched in shock. He had been wrong. This was not an innocent creature caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. This creature, whatever it was, was deeply sick. He had never seen such an advanced, aggressive case of the pestilence. He'd heard rumors, of course, but never encountered it firsthand. As a doctor, he had sworn to do no harm, but in a drastic situation, drastic measures have to be taken. It was well known by himself and the doctors at this foundation that he could cause any and all biological functions in an organism to cease with a single touch. And so he approached the creature arm outstretched, ready to administer that necessary touch to protect the rest of his patients. As he approached, the creature turned to him, its eyes wide and blank, an endless stream of tears pouring from them spilling onto the floor. It shrieked again, mouth stretching wide enough to engulf his entire head, and ran toward him at a breakneck speed. I am so sorry you are not well, the doctor said simply, as his hand pressed to the creature's chest. As soon as the tough hide of the doctor's hand, which the uninformed might mistake for gloves, made contact with the unpigmented skin of the beast, its eyes closed, its muscles went slack, and it collapsed to the ground with a mighty thud. The doctor paced around the fallen creature, taking in the sight. Then something strange caught his eye. The creature's chest still rose and fell. Was it his imagination? He checked its pulse and thought it was slow and faint. And though it was slow and faint, it was very much present. The creature was still alive. It had merely been rendered unconscious by his touch rather than completely deceased. Curious, very curious indeed he muttered. Perhaps there were comorbidities present, other infections aside from the pestilence, which rendered the creature unnaturally strong, resilient to the usual courses of treatment. What would cause these abilities, this intense aggression? It seemed to be brought on whenever someone looked at the entity's face. If only he studied psychology more, the science of the mind and its inner workings. Since he had no experience with therapy, nor was he certain this creature could communicate using language at all, there was only one way to find out more about how this creature's brain worked. He would have to take it apart and see for himself. It was slow work, getting the massive creature back to the doctor's containment cell. He required the help of his cured patients, who grasped it by its massive limbs and dragged the limp body through the halls. Once back in a familiar environment, his work table ready and waiting, the doctor instructed his assistants to place the new patient on the table. It was a bit small, unable to accommodate the creature's distended limbs, but if he attempted to use an official foundation laboratory, he risked discovery and subsequent interruption. So it would have to suffice. First, he set up an IV stand, filled with a vivid green liquid. It was easy to find a vein. The creature's skin was nearly translucent. Now that he could be certain the creature would not wake during surgery, he could make the first incision. Scalpel. He held out a hand and his favorite surgical blade was placed in it by one of the helpful patients. Thank you. He slid the scalpel along the hairline of the creature, or where the hairline would be if it weren't completely bald. Once the scalp was removed, 
He set it aside for later, when it could be reattached. Bonsa, please. He held out his hand again, and again his assistant gave him the proper tool. This, however, was when things got strange. The doctor had always been a deft hand at cutting. He'd once even received tutelage from the great Robert Liston, but no matter how hard he tried to saw, it never left a scratch on the creature's skeleton. Naturally, this was somewhat frustrating. He wanted to study the creature's brain tissue, to get a sense for what was going up there neurologically, and he couldn't do that if it was impossible to saw off the creature's cranial cap. He blunted two of his favorite saws while trying. Thankfully, there was still a solution to access the beast's gray matter, a little trick he'd learned while studying the funerary practices of the ancient Egyptians. He produced a long curved hook from his bag and inserted it up the creature's nasal passage. With some fine maneuvering, he eventually managed to remove the brain. It was such a terrible shame that he needed to do it piece by piece via the nasal passage, but one makes do. All that was left was to sew the skin of the creature's head back into place. It was mid-stitch when a voice interrupted his careful work, nearly making him drop the needle. Hey, what are you doing? He looked up to find a guard, aiming a gun at his face. Excuse me, I am in surgery at the moment. Please do not interrupt. He admonished the guard, but the man did not listen or lower his weapon. In fact, he shouted something into the radio, code words the doctor didn't recognize. Then he fired a bullet into the skull of the patient standing at his side. How dare you? The doctor cried, readying himself to confront the guard, but it was too late. Dozens of other guards were swarming the room and neutralizing his assistants. Some in hazmat suits grabbed his arms and pulled him away from the creature on the operating table, no matter how hard he fought or how loudly he protested. Then something incredible happened, something wonderful. The creature opened its eyes and sat up. It looked directly at the guard closest to it, and the two saw one another's faces. The guard tensed, preparing for the worst, but nothing came. The creature simply stared, placid and quiet. No screaming, no tearing at flesh, no mouth opening wider and wider to swallow the man whole. I did it, the doctor shouted, overcome with elation. I've cured you. Now begins the rest of your happy life. He watched as the guards led the shockingly calm creature away back to its containment cell. The doctor's door was repaired, and he was returned to his state of captivity, but he never forgot the patient he helped that day, and how marvelous it felt to do such a good deed. Meanwhile, SCP-096's brain regrew within the hour and caused another massive containment breach, murdering a variety of researchers and guards, but the staff agreed not to tell SCP-049 about any of this. Better to just let him have this one. He really seemed like he needed a win. Now go check out SCP-049 The Plague Doctor, Everything You Need to Know, and SCP-096 Shy Guy Escape, Incident 096-1-A Containment Breach for more videos on today's terrifying combatants.